I see that uh, people are joining us um, every second. There's a new person coming in, which is fantastic. I'm uh, Denise Stockley. I'm the president of the Society for Teaching and Learning Higher Education. And uh, Keep Teaching and these weekly webinars are part of our response as a community uh, to COVID-19 and, and where people are at. And I'm going to turn the floor to Carolyn just to talk a bit about the panel and about participating in a Zoom. All right, welcome. So one of the first things to know about our Zoom sessions for keepteaching.ca is that we record them because we have many requests from people who say, I can't make it, but I really want to see it. So just so you know, we are recording. What gets recorded is the screen that you see in front of you, which is the slide. So we're not recording necessarily um, all the side videos, but if you are going to be speaking, you may get captured by the, you will get captured by the recording. Um, we also tend to download the chat and that includes anything that is um, kind of for everyone in the chat. So just so you know, if you're putting something in the chat, that may be something that gets posted. So we just wanted to make sure people are aware of that. My name is Carolyn Hosler. I'm the Education Developer Caucus's Vice Chair of Communications, and I am also your Zoom tech flight attendant for today. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of a round of Zoom. In the top uh, right side, you will see the opportunity to switch your view. So if you wanna see the Brady Bunch style, all the cameras, um, you're able to do that by clicking the gallery view. If you want a more focused approach, you can see just the person speaking, you click on the speaker view. At the bottom of your screen, if you go down, you'll be able to see something called chat and you'll be able to see um, participant lists. You can see kind of the names of people in here. If you see the chat function, you're able to also, um, um, with the chat function, you're able to kind of send people messages. You're also able to kind of go in the group and add any questions that you have and those questions will be monitored. So more information about how the panel is gonna work is gonna come next but I wanted to just give you that kind of orientation to Zoom for those of you who are still new to it. Please note at the bottom, um, there is a mute and a video. You can turn those on and off. We're asking people to keep themselves on mute unless they're their panelists so that we don't hear the background noises. Um, and if you decide to have a conversation with somebody who walks in the room, we don't all uh, participate in that. So please uh, keep yourself on mute unless you're actively trying to talk or ask a question, but um, the chat's available for posting questions for sure. My other task is I get to share with you the opening poll. So if you go to the opening poll, there is, um, I'm pasting it into the chat window. If you have already completed the poll, that's wonderful. It's the same one that keeps getting posted because every time someone new comes, they just see the chat where it starts. So that's why I keep posting the link. But the opening poll, if you go in, you used to be able to click the link. Zoom security features mean you now have to copy and paste. It is a bit.ly link, so it should be easier to type. And it's bit.ly, so B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash 16 students, or you can copy and paste it. So I'm just going to take the screen and I'm going to show you the results of our poll so far. So, so far we have individuals coming in from Quebec, Ontario, um, Manitoba, Alberta, and British Columbia. The roles are 20% of them are students. And we also have individuals who are deans or department leaders, educators, teaching center leaders, education developers, or part of the, um, or we have tradition um, transition coordinators as well. What's your current status? We're 50-50 at the moment, and that's just changing, as you see, as responses come in. There's waiting, um, no one's waiting, no one's encouraged, everyone is either access restricted or access closed. And what is the status of spring and summer? Everyone is going online or remote, who's responded. The fall classes are in discussion, and as a student, the plans are to continue coursework as planned or they'll be graduated. So that gives us the three responses so far. And would you see yourself as a formal leader, an informal leader, a formal or an end informal, or a person interested in becoming a leader? And we have a bit of a mix here, including quite a bit of informal leadership. So just returning to the top, we've had some people join in from the East Coast. We have some people from Nova Scotia and PEI, as well as the other places. So please continue um, completing the poll and we will, um, kind of show, I believe, if we have the time, you can see at the end, we also um, will be posting the results of these polls um, as just a bit of a summary so that people can see where people are coming from and what's happening across the country. 
So thank you very much for everybody for coming today. I'll just keep showing the poll as we get the last responses in because we have 42 people in here and we have only 25 responses. Um, and then we'll be handing it over to the panel. Just a reminder that when you're in the chat, if someone private messages you, it will automatically flip who you're sending your messages to. So just make sure if you're sending a message in the chat, you double check that that blue box where just above it still says everyone if it is going to be a question for everyone. Um, Heather, are you receiving any questions that people don't want to make anonymous? Sure, you can uh, message me privately if you'd like. Okay, so if you click that drop down menu and you see the name Heather um, Carroll, who's a co host, um, if you just click on that name, that way you could post a question if you're just a little bit concerned about others seeing you're asking that question, because when you do post in the chat, it does attach your name to it. Great. So, Thanks, Carolyn. And uh, we're, as I was mentioning, we're very excited. We will be posting the poll uh, throughout the, the session, so feel free to drop in. It, as you saw with Carolyn, as people put in responses, it does change. But I don't want to take any more time away, and I want to introduce Heather Carroll, who is one of our 3M National Student Fellows from 2014, and Brandon Sloren, who's on the STLHE board as a student advisor to everyone, and uh, open it up and allow you to introduce your panel. Um, perfect. So thanks, Denise. My name is Heather Carroll. I'm a current master's student at Harvard University, and I'm with the 3M Council. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, Brandon, if you would like to take it away, and then you will get to meet our student leaders for today. Certainly. Hi, everyone. My name is Brandon Sabrin. I'm a PhD student, or PhD candidate, I should say. That's fairly new, so I've forgotten already. Uh, at the University of Windsor, and I am the current Chair of Student Advocacy on the STLHE Board of Directors. And it's a real pleasure to have all of you here today. Um, when we were first designing this webinar and uh, Denise reached out to us and, and wondered if this would be of interest, immediately Heather and I thought that this would be an excellent idea. Uh, because a lot of the conversation has been around how to help faculty and instructors move the teaching and learning experiences that they had planned online in a hurry. Um, and from our perspective as students, we think that there's really an, a vital piece to the conversation, and that is how students um, are perceiving this and how they are experiencing these new transitions. And so we decided to uh, reach out to an awesome group of students uh, who I will ask to introduce themselves in just a moment so that they can provide some of their uh, perspectives from their various uh, locations and particular educational settings. So uh, with that, I'd like to ask our student panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, let's go in the order um, that was listed. So we'll start with Tari and then Isabella and then Yash, Tiffany and then Frit. So go ahead, each of you can take your minute here and introduce yourselves to the group. Thanks so much, Brandon. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Tari Ajadi. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in political science at Dalhousie University. I'm also a 3M National Student Fellow 2014, so the same cohort as Heather. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, my interests kind of hew towards uh, looking at the intersection between racism, public policy, and public advocacy um, in health and criminal justice. So that's a little bit about me. I'm very interested in teaching and learning. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. So thanks very much for having me. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Isabella, Isabella Bobby. Um, I am a second year developmental psychology with thesis student um, at the University of Windsor. Um, I actually work with Brandon on uh, research projects um, as a part of my role as an outstanding scholar at the University of Windsor. Um, which I'm very, very proud of, and I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you so much for having me, and um, I look forward to, um, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry if you can hear all that. <laughs> um, I look forward to chatting with all of you about this issue today. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yash Chopra. I am a, I'm an international student at Red River College, currently enrolled in business administration program. And I'm currently working with uh, the Red River College Students Association on their uh, executive committee. Um, 
that's that's pretty much from my side. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany McLennan and I'm a chemistry student at St. Effax University. Uh, I've been working for a few years now with the university uh, on retention issues and sitting on the University Senate and the University Board of Governors. And um, so I'm really delighted to be invited into this conversation today because I've been involved with a lot of the conversations from the schools um, across the Atlantic provinces overall. So I'm really happy to be here and share some of my thoughts with you all. Hi everyone, I'm Britt Paris. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary. Uh, my research focuses on the impact of instructional design on how students take up feedback and whether or not they take up feedback. Um, and I'm chair of the Graduate College at the University of Calgary as well. Very happy to be here, thanks so much. Thank you to all of our student panelists. So we'll start with our first question, which is, uh, what was your experience of the hurried transition to the online remote delivery of classes, exams, and research activities in this semester? Uh, I suppose I could, I could start. So I, you know, as a student, I have to say, I did experience a fair amount of confusion um, being in your PhD and, and especially at the stage that I am in um, developing a thesis proposal, on one hand, you would think that it doesn't really affect you, that your research is individual, that, you know, not, not being able to be on campus doesn't really have much of an impact. But um, on the other hand, the ability to engage with people, to engage with my professors, to ask for advice, to access books, all of these things, and of course, the kind of worries about uh, issues of whether or not I can access resources, uh, issues of funding, what's going to happen in the future, those things were all very, very scary. Um, but I'm also currently instructing a class, just concluding instructing a class. And in that way, I actually felt extremely supported and encouraged by uh, my university, by the folks in the kind of teaching and learning center, by all the resources that we were given, uh, because our primary goal um, and perspective was trying to support students wherever possible. And so I realized that, you know, their classes may be the last thing on their mind. And so the, the, the onus was on providing them with a kind of flexible mode of learning that was navigable in an uncertain time and also being able to give them as much information as possible. So I thought it was really helpful from that perspective. Thank you, Tari. I'm not sure if anyone else is frozen, but Heather is frozen on me. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Um, so I've been mostly affected in terms of my research. So I'm actually in my data collection semester and I'm working with five university instructors and their students. Uh, and um, I went from having in-person focus groups to obviously not being allowed to do that anymore. Uh, so actually my uh, research ethics board was very quick to respond and I was able to get uh, amendments to um, have focus groups on Zoom and then as well to have students actually just respond to questions by email. Um, so I felt supported by the institution in that way. But then my research participants, uh, the instructors have been great, but obviously they're not really so concerned about feedback anymore. They now want to talk about online stuff and all those sorts of things. So. Uh, my research questions are taking a bit of a turn, uh, but in terms of working with the undergraduate students, obviously they have a lot of other things on their mind. And so I'm getting pretty much zero response rate from my students now. Um, and so as you can imagine, that's very stressful. Uh, and I feel now that my degree will likely be delayed because I may have to go back and collect more data or shift my research project a bit. Um, this is also then really stressful because I have funding that will run out and there is no word from the federal government or from the university on what they're doing about graduate student grants or graduate student scholarships. Uh, there's no word on if or how those will be extended. So tenure clocks have been extended, I think, across the country, but PhD clocks and master's clocks not necessarily. So that's one thing that's on my mind. I can uh, hop into this next. Um, so I am currently an undergraduate student and I'm kind of at an interesting point because I submitted my thesis this morning. Um, I defend on Monday. Um, so it's been really interesting because when we had closed the campus, thanks, I see that little clap over there. Um, when 
when our campus had shut down, I still had things to do. I still had trials to run. I was just finishing up a lot of my research. I was still in the middle um, of writing. And one of the things that I found really hard was that where I couldn't go to the campus anymore, I lost access to almost every single article I was using because I didn't have um, the access that I would if I was using my campus's um, VPN. So that was one of the things that was really a struggle for me in terms of my actual research because there was a lot of things that I was hoping to do that I no longer get to. Um, from a classroom standpoint, um, I'm a chemistry student, so our classes are pretty easy to move online. We do a lot of things, just kind of chalk and talk, um, which is really nice in that regard. A lot of our professors are really quick to learn how to use Zoom. Um, from a student standpoint, though, something that uh, my friends and I had noticed is that we're in Nova Scotia and BC and China, and all of a sudden uh, we have an exam on Friday at 9 a.m. and that's 11 p.m. for one of my friends, and that's 2 a.m. for another one of my friends. So that's one of the things that have really been a challenge. So I will jump in next. Um, so as I'd mentioned before, I am a second year undergraduate student. Um, so my experience has definitely been a little bit different. Um, probably being the youngest one in the in the webinar right now. Um, so I've noticed as well being a, um, a social science student um, that the way that my professors move their lectures is very different. Um, Tiffany, you had mentioned that your professors are very quick to move over to Zoom. Um, almost all of my professors canceled our lectures and um, just posted them online. Um, which was very difficult because it's hard to teach yourself that kind of material. Um, so that was definitely a challenge. Um, but my research was affected as well because um, Brandon and I usually met every single week um, to discuss our um, discuss our progress and what our next steps were going to be for our research. And now we've had to move everything online, um, which it's, it's been a challenge definitely. Um, but stuff has definitely been pushed back. We had planned to do a lot more research. We plan to um, do our own project and actually conduct um, surveys and write our own um, paper. And now we've had to move that into a SLR, a systematic literature review, because we don't have the option to um, interview students. So that all of that has been a struggle, but we are we are getting through it. <laughs> I'm a business administration student and um, I'm not a big fan of uh, online delivery of classes, but yes, transition was required. Um, Red River College has a lot of skilled trades programs, uh, plumbing, electrician programming, cabinetry and technology. So a lot of problem arise there where the practical classes were more necessary. So and also one of the problems that students were facing at Red River was having the access to the latest technology. Um, I mean, they were supposed to install all the learning management system tools, the WebEx and all the uh, technology stuff that was required. So that was, again, one of the issues that students were facing. And I mean, personally, I didn't had any exposure to uh, online delivery of classes before. So it was a big transition for me. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks all of you very much for giving that insight there. So now some of you are, are in your research phase of your degree and others are in your program and, and others of you are continuing classes beyond the semester and, and a few of you are, are no longer in classes. So I'm wondering, for those of you who are continuing research activities or continuing coursework, what are some things that you think you'll need to be, you'll need to have to be successful in the semester to come? Yeah, so I'll jump, jump in here. Um, so I am taking um, intercession classes. I don't, I'm not sure if they call it intercession at other colleges and universities. Um, for the University of Windsor, we call it intercession summer classes, um, which start at the end of May um, and intercession will go until June, um, end of June, and then the summer classes will go until the end of August. Um, and those have all been moved online. Intercession and the summer classes have all been moved online. Um, so it's um, definitely been a challenge um, having getting to choose the classes. 
Um, a lot of classes that I'd planned on taking um, are no longer available because they cannot be done online, um, which kind of pushes me back a little bit. Um, but in terms of what, um, in terms of undergraduate students, at least, I'm, I'm sure it'd be the same for uh, graduate students, um, would be Zoom lectures I find are great. Um, I do like Zoom, um, but I would more prefer so we can kind of do things on our own time through this stressful, because it's a very stressful time we're going through right now. So it might be hard for people to be able to get online at a certain time of the day um, and that kind of thing. That's just my opinion. Um, but what I found, um, a professor did this for us this semester, was he um, posted the lectures and attached um, an audio. So he spoke the lecture as he was, um, as he was saying it in class. Um, so that was really helpful. And I find that that'd be a great thing for um, professors to do in the future is add their audio as they're lecturing to the slides. Um, so we can take our notes and listen to the audio at the same time. I found that that was very helpful. Um, as well as just good old fashioned videos explaining topics. Um, those are great as well, especially for the, for the uncertain times we're in, making things work that, that we may, may not be used to. Um, so yeah, I feel like the, the audio attached to the lectures is something that really helped me. So um, yeah, thank you. Would anyone else like to take a stab at this question? Okay, um, we'll segue into our next question and Britt is gonna be our uh, next respondent, um, which is what is the best support that you have received from your institutions or professors so far? I think it's so uh, important to highlight good work. So over to you, Britt. Thanks. Um, so I've actually been on kind of both sides of helping others move their courses online and then receiving support in moving my research online. Um, so one thing I've noticed at my institution is that they've been really responsive in uh, like we have the Taylor Institute for Teaching and Learning, which has been quite responsive in terms of getting um, uh, teaching continuity resources out there. We transitioned over from Adobe Connect to Zoom, I think within like 72 hours. Uh, and Zoom became available to everyone. So even students can set up meetings. So that's been really helpful. Like I was able to move my research focus groups over to Zoom with the instructors within just a few days. Um, so research services was very responsive and uh, the um, teaching and learning was really responsive as well with getting those resources up. Uh, and then I've actually also been able to um, uh, pick up some work, which is good in uh, helping instructors move their courses online. So I'm working with our school of public policy to do that. And also with the Taylor Institute to move our um, teaching and learning certificate for academic staff online. Um, so it's just kind of a happy, um, uh, coincidence that I have experienced in online teaching and learning. So I was able to, to help out with that. So um, there are some things I wish they were uh, a bit more supportive in. Um, I think I, I'm trying to be also compassionate for my supervisors uh, and not, not try to, to push um, for things too quickly. Um, but they have been very, very responsive when I needed the research um, amendments done to my ethics application and things like that. Perfect. Um, I think Tari wanted to speak about supervisors as well, and then we can pass it over to Yash. Hi, yeah. So um, my supervisor has been really supportive, actually, uh, during this process. You know, uh, she touched base pretty early on, um, asked me if I needed anything as a person, right? Like, asked if I needed any groceries dropped off. Um, we've since been in touch pretty consistently. Um, you know, the deadlines that we... Um, that we had set for, for example, a draft of my thesis proposal to be submitted. We've all, we, we, we've come to a kind of understanding and conclusion that, hey, maybe those need to be extended because productivity isn't going to be the same. And that in fact, just being able to kind of cope in this time um, is something that we really need. And I think that, you know, I'm really lucky to have that kind of support currently, but I know there's a lot of folks that don't, right? And, and I think that, what universities often do is for grad students, they outsource a lot of the kind of work that would be done by kind of student um, advising and student success centers um, for undergraduates to supervisors in graduate school. And what ends up happening is that then you have this very kind of tenuous relationship where 
for some people, maybe that you're getting the support you need, but for others, maybe you're not getting that support at all. And so I think that, you know, there might need to be a way to kind of standardize that level of support and resources um, for as many people as possible, um, regardless of the supervisors that they have. Thank you. And Yash? Yes, moving to the support received by institution and professors. Uh, uh, one of the biggest support that we received was the, uh, the PowerPoint voiceovers. Uh, as mentioned by Bella, I guess uh, the uh, instructors did the voiceover on the PowerPoints, like the, uh, the way they deliver the lectures in the class, and it was really helpful. And also, uh, for example, in accounting. So the instructors used to solve the problem and explain it step by step, like how are the IFRS policies and how the questions are solved. So uh, our instructors solved the entire problems on Word with all the detailed explanation. It was, it was time consuming, but yes, the instructors are putting an effort and uh, sending us all the detailed explanation of all the questions following the instructional schedule and keeping uh, things and classes on track. Thank you. Perfect. And our last comment on this question goes to Tiffany. Yeah, so I've had a few really great supports from my institution, actually. So one of the first ones was that my thesis deadline got pushed back a week, which was more than needed. Um, I expected to be able to be as productive um, as I was. It definitely wasn't the case. Um, but another thing that and maybe it wasn't so much on the teaching and learning side, but from the institution overall was that our institution, uh, so I'm at St. FX University, went above and beyond in actually financially supporting their students. So I'm a first generation student from a low income background who did lose their job because of what is going on. And um, so one of the things that comes from that is that I didn't quite fall under curb funding, didn't quite fall under any of these bodies of funding that are floating around. Um, but our university really stepped up and went to our alumni right away and said, look, we have hundreds of students who are currently in need. Uh, and they were able to raise a lot of money really quickly. So little things like being able to stay in my apartment in Anaganish for an extra month. Yep, does that stop? Okay. Uh, Sorry, continue, Tess. Yeah, and um, just having that ability to be able to stay and having some funding from the university um, just to be able to meet my needs but then knowing from some of my friends who are really financially struggling uh, that was some of the best supports that they had received i would actually like to add on to that um yeah so like as a, as a student the most support i received was that um for my Hi, i'm exam. sorry we're only accepting comments from the panelists thank you brandon um, Brandon, would you like to go for our next question? Tiffany, actually, you, you touched upon this and I'd like to uh, follow up with it. So uh, even though there are some things that can be considered by institutions and professors and, and those we work with, um, there are other factors that are compounding, uh, perhaps compounding your experience as a student that are kind of at a distance or, or not particularly related to um, the setting that you're studying in. So are there things that are non-academic that have um, conflicted with your current studies or are there things that are non-academic that have kind of changed the way that you're approaching your, your studies at this time? Uh, maybe. Not so much for me. I know there's people who are, um, I'm lucky enough, like I said, I got to stay in Anaganish, Nova Scotia, but the reason that I stayed here was because when I go home, um, I'm not able to do work. I have family uh, who live with me and where they haven't really gone through uh, the university setting, they really, they try really hard to understand um, what I need to be able um, to do to study, but they don't understand boundaries as much as I love them. And um, so I got really lucky where I've been able to stay here and been able to continue to do work. Um, but I know there's lots of people who aren't in the same boat. Yeah, so I could uh, talk about that as well. Um, so 
for a very long time now, um, I think it's totally okay to talk about, but I've struggled a great amount with my mental health. Um, and one of the things that make it so, um, that make it um, better and easier to handle is having a routine. Um, is I wake up, I go to school, I come home, I do my workout. And the, um, with, with COVID that kind of just all um, vanished. Um, my routine vanished. And um, so it was very important for me in order to, um, um, that's right. It was very important for me in order to maintain the mental health and not um, let it get away from me and go into the, the dark place again, um, to maintain my routine um, to, to the T that it was as much as possible. Um, so I needed to spend my days as if I was going to school and doing the same thing. So I would get up, I, I have to um, not lay in bed all day, get up, brush my teeth, take a shower, do my makeup, all of that stuff in order to feel as normal as possible. Um, make schedules. That is something that has been very um, helpful for me is making a schedule for my day. Um, 8.30 to 10.30, relax and have breakfast. 10.30 to 12.30, schoolwork, then, and so on and so on. Setting time for schoolwork, setting time for studying, setting time for free time, setting time for self-care. Um, so those are things that have very, very helped, um, very, very have made a difference in terms of um, me handling this situation. Um, and I, I'm sure it's the same thing for a bunch of people is that their mental health has been greatly um, affected by this. Um, so if there's anything I, you guys can take away from what I just said, if you are struggling like me, is make a schedule for your day and try to stick to it as much as possible. Um, and make your routine, um, routine a, lot, a lot smoother. Awesome, thanks for that piece of advice, Isabel. Uh, let's, uh, let's hear from a few more. Britt and Tari, you have some ideas on this? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> I agree. Like a lot of what Bella and Tiffany said, I've actually never been good at routine ever. I've tried my entire life to be better at routines. And then um, this has made it made it worse. Um, the first three weeks, I think was just I was in anxiety spirals and depression spirals about what does this mean for everything? Um, my life, not just school. Um, and so talking to others really helped that because I was really nice to know I wasn't alone and actually being on Twitter helped with that because I can see, okay, per, like tenured professors feel this way, undergrads feel this way, grad students feel this way. It's not just me. Um, so I learned to kind of forgive myself a bit. And then instead of using a, a schedule, I um, instead have like a priority list of what I need to get done each day. And that's helped because um, I have family at home who, who want my time and attention too. And also thinking of well, you're home, doesn't that mean you're available? And well, no, that doesn't mean I'm available. Um, and so trying to create more boundaries, which I've never been good at in the first place. And then as well with some of like the volunteer stuff that I've been doing. So I mentioned I'm chair of the Graduate College, which is similar to Massey College and, and Green College at UBC and U of T. Um, and we're trying to create community for our scholars as well. And so some of that just can easily eat up a whole day. Uh, and so having that priority list of, no, I need to get through other things first before I can uh, devote time to, to the volunteer work um, has helped as well. Yeah, so I, I'd love to hop in after that. And thanks so much, Britt, because I think you, you've set it up perfectly. For me, there's been so many different kind of divergent tracks to, to kind of pull me off of where I'd like to be. So. Um, I work on the side of my studies, not only um, as an instructor, but I also work for Statistics Canada. So I've got a contract to fulfill on that end. That takes a lot of my time. I also um, do quite a lot of community advocacy work, and especially in these times, given um, the, the kind of drastic inequities that COVID-19 is exposing, um, that's consumed a lot of my time and a lot of my emotional energy as well. Um, I've questioned... Um, what the value of my work is. I've questioned whether or not my work is, is more important than that community advocacy work. And then of course, there's the fact that I, I am, or rather I was an international student, I'm now a permanent resident, but so many of my family are elsewhere in other nations and we're all disconnected. Um, and you know, worrying about their welfare their well-being um, that takes time too. So for, for me, you know, I'm not a routine person. Um, I, I'm bad at prioritizing. Um, so the, the tactic that I've used is a capacity to quote unquote forgive myself. It's okay to be running at 30, 40, 50% capacity right now. It is what it is. This is, this is literally 
the most bizarre and most absurd situation that any of us could have imagined. So of course things are going to be difficult. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks so much. So our next question was very popular with our panelists. Um, so I'm just going to ask you guys to go in the same order that you introduced yourselves in. So that's back to you, Tari. Um, so the question is, what is one thing you would want your professors to know as they plan for future remote and online learning experiences? Okay, so for this, I'll speak um, more as an instructor um, than as a student. Um, I would strongly suggest that asynchronous learning is the way to go. It's the way to format uh, your lessons such that students can access them when they need them. Give generous, generous timelines for assignments. Um, if you're planning to do an end of term exam, make it a, make it a exam that can go over multiple days so students can fit it into their schedules and write the exam when they need give them a suggested kind of timeline for when they should do like sit let's say it's a two hour exam so fit your two hours in in the context of two three four days give them as much latitude and flexibility as possible because they're human beings first and their students second Right. And so I think that that's the most important thing that all professors um, should focus on fundamentally, whatever our outdated notions of rigor are. Um, I think empathy is far more important in this time. Tari, you said all of the points that I was going to say <laughs> um, in that. It is, school is very important, but first and foremost, we are going through a very, very stressful time, all of us, and first and foremost, we are human beings. Um, so it does take a toll on us, um, this change in routine. Um, so the, the um, being compassionate towards that, like for, like as an instructor, being compassionate that your students are struggling um, with this is, is the main thing. Um, for first year students, they have just gotten used to the transition from high school to university. Um, second year students, we've been doing second, third and fourth year students, we've been doing this a very long time, grad school students. So we're used to things a certain way. And now everything is just kind of flipped around and we have to start all over again. It's learning the system all over again. Um, so that is something that um, instructors need to take into consideration when planning um, um, syllabus um, and planning weightings of, um, of assignments and final exams. Um, deadlines. So those are things that I think are very important to kind of be relaxed a little bit, um, weigh things less, um, uh, make the timelines um, more flexible, all that kind of thing. So Tari really did hit it on the nose there, everything that I wanted to say. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, thank you for listening to uh, my version of his uh, explanation. Well, yes, um, a major point that was covered was um, regarding the quiz and exam timings. Um, another point that I would like to add, uh, specifically speaking from the business administration point of view, is that I would like to see more of applied projects or applied learning assignments uh, where we don't have a, a particular quiz of 5% for uh, a topic, for example, copyright and um, copyright registration assignment, like copyright registration. Maybe we can ha have had an assignment instead of a quiz of the chapter where the students are supposed to download the copyright application form from the government website, fill it out in and more of applied learning techniques. And again, yes, one of the major point was the quiz timing. So uh, providing flexibility, on the quiz and exam schedules would definitely be a very nice option. I mean, my final exams are scheduled for April last week. So uh, that would definitely help me a lot. And yep, um, applied learning projects, that would be my major point. Thanks. Yeah, if I could build on something that Isabella had alluded to is one of the things that I've noticed and one thing that I would really like to see people take away from this is we have to, I think we have to stop assuming that students understand how to learn online. 
because people just kind of make the assumption, oh, we're all tech savvy, you know, we all live on our phones. That definitely doesn't correlate to being able to learn online. And I know from uh, talking to a lot of first year students in particular, that that's something that they've been really struggling with is that these students are just being, here's this online platform, but aren't really being adequately supported and how do you take this and do something with it? A lot of the support is more on the professor side on how do you get a course up and running and maybe less so on the, how do we actually prep our students to learn online? And um, so I think kind of moving forward, if I would to pick one thing that could use a little bit of focus, I think that would be it. I have a lot to say on this topic, but I'm gonna to try to stick to one thing. Um, I would say, uh, also be be patient and gracious with yourself. Um, good is good enough. I've been working with some instructors who are spending time pre-recording their lectures and then so they can have more discussion based Zoom sessions. And uh, what I've been hearing is that they're spending three, four, five hours to record a 15 minute lecture because they want to get it perfect. And I think um, really you just have to accept that good is good enough. And if it's out there, it's good enough and it's much better to spend that time responding to student emails or in synchronous sessions uh, or office hours with students communicating spend that time on communication uh, versus trying to get the perfect pre-recorded lecture um, and, and be gracious with yourself in order to do that awesome thanks a lot everybody some of those points that you've talked about are points that have been discussed in other webinars uh, in this series and um, from a slightly different perspective, though, I think it's important to hear how students are uh, receiving the actions that are that are happening with uh, with our instructors and our educational developers. Uh, we do have a number of other students here in the webinar, and so I'm wondering the, from the panel, um, could each of you perhaps provide one tip or strategy that you would give to other students to be successful during an uncertain time such as this? Uh, I, I can go. Um, I think that one strategy that I've been using is what we might call the Pomodoro method. So, you know, it, for me, of course, it, or for a lot of students, you've got readings to do. Okay, but don't think that you can sit down for five hours straight and do your readings. Sit down for 25 minutes, do as much as you can. Ah, yes, look at the, <laughs> there we go, right? So <laughs> you look at the, you look at the, you look at the bucket, you, you take 15, 20, 25 minutes, and then you get up and you do a five minute stretch, rinse, wash, repeat, right? Like just break, break the day into pieces and know that you can't do eight hours at a time, right? Like the, <laughs> it's not functional. So do as much as you can and try to be um, as efficient as possible. I'd also like to know what that app is. <laughs> I can jump on next. Um, so, um, and additionally, I had mentioned earlier, um, creating a schedule for your day. Um, that is really very important. Um, setting times for yourself, like make on your notes app, on your iPhone or whatever phone you have, whatever you wanna do for that next day as you're falling asleep at night, make those notes of what the times you're gonna do certain things. Um, but other than that, I think that, um, just because we're, we're not getting up and going to work or school in the morning anymore doesn't mean that we can be staying up until the crack of dawn and then sleeping until 3, 4, 5 p.m. Um, have to admit that I did do that the first week um, of quarantine, but definitely getting back onto that routine, setting your, your sleep schedules better um, is going to change your entire mood, the way that you're sleeping, going to, the, going to bed when the sun goes down, getting up when it comes up not the other way around. Um, that's gonna make a huge difference in your mental health, your physical health, how you feel throughout the day, um, your eating habits, the way that you sleep is going to, to be the, uh, the determining factor of how um, you are spending this quarantine, how you're managing, in my opinion. Well, focusing on mental health would be a, a very big point and Again, when it comes to academics, uh, my major suggestion would be like since uh, the lectures are all available on the learning management system with the 
PowerPoint voiceovers and students have 24 hour access to the lectures and the course materials. Uh, so uh, my suggestion would be to stay on track with the lectures. I mean, not to just uh, fall behind that, okay, a lecture is being posted every day, Monday to Friday, so that's five lectures a week. So the students should not think that they can just put in five hours on Friday and complete all the week course materials on one single day. Because I mean, yes, we do have 24 hour access to the lectures. They are all PowerPoint voiceovers. But again, staying on track of time is, is a really big task. Um, so again, that, that would be my suggestion. Thanks. Yeah, my suggestion, I think, would be don't be afraid to communicate with people. If there's something that you need, uh, no accommodation can ever be made if someone doesn't know what it is. So um, being able to have open and honest communication uh, with your professors or your lab assistants or whoever it may be, uh, I think is the, one of the major keys to success. Uh, for me, it's um, find a community. Uh, you're not alone. And I think this is one of the biggest things for graduate students, uh, particularly those of us who are in social sciences. We don't have a lab. We tend to be isolated anyway, so we're better at finding community. Um, but suddenly we have a whole bunch of undergrad students who are used to seeing their friends every day or every other day in classes and suddenly they don't have that anymore. So I'd say um, find free channels to create that community. So Slack is a great place where you can uh, have ongoing chats, set up ongoing video chats or regular video chats with that community and, and touch base with each other because you're really not alone. Um, and people who are struggling have a really hard time reaching out. So don't wait for people to reach out to you. Um, reach out to your classmates who you know are gonna be in the same class or send a whole class email and say, hey, let's set up a Slack channel to, to reach out to each other. But really find that community and stay in touch. Um, even though we have to be physically distant, we, we need to still be socially connected. Perfect. Um, so now we're just going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, if you would like, you can message in the chat. Uh, make sure your setting is sent to everyone if you would like it to be a public question. If not, you can definitely message me directly and I have no problem um, anonymizing your question for you. I noticed that we did have one come in earlier from Gail and I'm just going to open this up to any of the student panelists who would like to respond. Uh, she's curious to know if or how online exams have been managed. Um, especially accommodated exams. Um, so feel free to take this question on. Um, and in the interest of getting through enough, uh, um, multiple questions, we'll keep this very brief. So I'm going to open that question up to our student panelists. I can uh, jump on this really quickly. Um, for the social sciences, at least, um, I can't speak to other departments. Um, but for us, um, my professors made a lot of our exams um, optional. Um, which I greatly appreciated. Um, we could have taken the option for a grade freeze. Um, a lot of my um, classes also offered um, um, short papers um, in, in um, 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 I don't know what the word is, but in, in place of um, the final exam. Um, one of my finals, um, instead of being made multiple choice, um, was made um, all like essay questions and then short answers that we could have um, completed before. We had about five days to um, complete them and then we could have submit them on the actual exam day. Um, so that was really great. And then another um, one of my classes was um, multiple choice as well. Um, 90 multiple choice. So we had 24 hours to complete it, um, which was really helpful. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, um, but that was my experience with um, my program. All right, we have an, another question here in the chat. This is from Erica Kustra. Uh, she's wondering if any of you on the panel might, might know how we could help first year students. So I know that none of you are first year students, but uh, if there are any first year students incoming in the fall, how we can help them to uh, navigate these uncharted waters that we're still trying to figure out ourselves. I'll jump in on this one, Brandon. Um, I think uh, Tiffany nails it on the head earlier when she said, no one's teaching us how to learn online. 
Um, and we're also seeing that these students are finishing high school if they're coming directly from high school. Uh, they've been doing online stuff to some degree and some school boards are doing better and some teachers are doing better than others. Um, so basically they're going to have a very varied uh, experience with online learning. So we definitely can't assume that they know how to learn online when they come to us in the fall. Um, so I think we really need to shift our um, our orientation programs from orienting to campus and all those sorts of things to orienting to online learning. Um, uh, my you know, university, Workland School of Education, actually has a lot of online programs, master's level programs, and they do a full 10 day online orientation for online learning. And now I'm working with the School of Public Policy to do an online uh, orientation for their students as well who are coming brand new and have to start online. So I think, yeah, we just need, we need to shift our orientation and we really need to set up expectations, but around with a framework of compassion, um, but really support them in these tools and get them oriented to these tools very early on. I could hop in there as well, uh, just to kind of bounce off something that Britt had mentioned. Um, I think another part of this is that we have to start doing this now. Um, I don't think it's something that happens in September or late August. It's something that we need to start communicating with incoming students now. And um, there's probably a lot of uncertainty with uh, these students who may have been planning on attending an institution, but now might be second guessing um, if it's the right choice. And that's definitely something that we've experienced at St. FX. Um, so one of the things that we really need to start doing is how do we start communications with our incoming students and figure out what they need so we can work over the next few months to actually have it in place come September. Awesome, thanks so much. I just invite anyone else who's in the webinar here, if you have another question, feel welcome to type it in the chat, either in the public chat or to Heather directly. Are there any other comments that the panelists would like to make at this point? I, I'm conscious of time and seeing we have about five minutes left. Um, just wondering if there are any final thoughts that you'd like to um, Brandon, one just appeared in the chat. Oh, yes. um, beyond Zoom, Beautiful. are there any other platforms you've been using? And if so, have you found them more or less easy to learn than Zoom? Um, so any student panelists, Terry, I think I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, so um, I've, I, I think at Dow, um, the onus is on using Teams um, quite a bit. And I've, I've found it to be relatively mixed. I think that they're trying to mix in kind of a, a Slack kind of model along with video chatting. I'm not sure that it does anything fantastically. I don't know how it works with more than four or five uh, people in there. That's the most that I've, I've seen in there, but it seemed to be pretty good and you can kind of drop in files there. So maybe you wouldn't use it for a class format overall, but maybe you'd use it for group work, for example. I could certainly see that. Um, so I, I have a bit of experience with Microsoft Teams and I thought it was quite decent. Um, nothing else apart from that. Um, over here, I've been using Zoom, Teams, Blue Jeans, and one that I don't even know the name of, uh, and Skype. Um, I can tell you right now, it's been a disaster. Um, if I would say, I would love for institutions just to pick one um, and go with it because there's things that we're running into now where it's, oh, well, I thought we were supposed to be meeting. Oh, well, I forgot what platform we're meeting on. So it's been really confusing trying to navigate five different platforms at once. Definitely, I think that you bring up a good point, Tiffany, there with, with the move to online learning, I, I feel as though some instructors um, are under the impression that they need to have the latest and greatest technologies. And you know, one of the, one of the tips that has been promoted in numerous documents I've seen is you know, just to keep it simple and, and not overload students with new tools. And yeah, five is a lot, definitely a lot. Um, we have a question from Erica. Um, we've been asked about expectations about enrollment. Have you heard any rumors about students' plans for enrollment changing? I guess this would be uh, an anecdotal of it, or an anecdotal question from our student panelists. Um, anyone? I just commented, I think um, check out your institution's subreddits 
Uh, that's actually where I'm seeing a fair bit of chatter about this. Um, and actually there was a question posed by one of the students like who's planning on on um, taking time off who's planning on sticking around and there's some good chatter happening there. Um, so I think it is something students are, are considering and thinking about, but it's really hard to know any numbers based off of that. But I think um, going on to your on your institution subreddit will give you an idea of the conversations that are happening. I'd also say that, especially for graduate students, um, you know, you've got office of there's going to be folks with office of admission whose funding timelines may be whose funding may be tenuous. And of course, especially if they are potentially international students, um, I can only imagine the kind of anxiety that that might bring. So I, you know, that's not to say what is or isn't happening at Dalhousie. I'm not, I'm not really sure, but it is to say that like these are things to be thinking about um, in a major way that that funding is uh, a real concern. Okay, so we have one last question here and then we'll wrap up. Um, Chris is asking, how can we best promote writing centers or other student services that have traditionally been physical uh, services on campus? How, how might those be accessible to you online or remotely? Any thoughts for the panel? So um, at our university, the University of Windsor, um, we have something called our um, writing support desk, um, which is a free service that students um, have access to. It's pretty much like grammar and, and paragraph um, editing and stuff like that. And um, I know that they actually have their own social media um, that they promote on and um, you can contact them through email. I've been getting emails from them every few days um, promoting that they're having um, Zoom sessions. Um, about formatting um, for citations, APA Chicago, MLA. And all that kind of stuff and they promote this on their social media as well for incoming students and potential students. Um, so definitely promoting it through social media and then uh, making it ac um, ac accessible, pardon me, through um, either online chat like this, um, through Zoom, Google Hangouts, um, would probably be easier for um, through the email, um, through our U Windsor emails, our school emails. Um, so yeah, making it accessible, making sure that they know that it's out there um, and then contacting them um, in whatever way you can. Uh, a quick, a quick ad and shout out to the folks at uh, Dell Student Success um, um, Organization and the Teaching and Learning Centers. What they did is they literally created a module in the LMS that we have, um, offering resources. And I thought that was a really good way to do it because you're getting notifications all the time, right? So for for students that are already in there for their classes, um, I think that's a really impactful way to kind of get as many resources out to folks as possible. So that was a great, great idea and a great job to them. All right, just wrapping up here, I wanted to say such a big thank you to our student panelists. I know another hour on Zoom is like never the most appealing ask, but they uh, came out for us anyway and um, really provided such insightful uh, questions and comments. And I'm just deeply appreciative and I'm sure Brandon echoes that sentiment. So. Thank you so much to our student panelists. And thank you all of you for attending this webinar. It's, um, it's been really, really nice to see the, the turnout today and, and hear some of the student experiences. I think that uh, those are, these are some of the many voices we need to consider as we're, um, as we're planning, you know, not just our classes, but our, our institutional operations going forward as well. Um, in this particular time of COVID and in other times, right? It's causing us to kind of reflect on, you know, what our best practices normally, right? Aside from this particular context. So uh, with that, I'll just, I'll just ask if uh, Denise Stockley has anything else that she would like to say before we conclude the webinar. Sorry about that. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I, privately messaged, but a big thank you to everybody. This has been fascinating. You are also a part of our first Zoom bomb, so yay for us. Um, but uh, it's always exciting to hear different voices and uh, thank you very much. That's it. Excellent. Thank you, everyone.